Welcome to the Movement PT Coffee Cast, where we sit down and talk about physical therapy, health, and whatever else comes to mind during our coffee infused conversations. What's going on, guys? Welcome back to the Movement PT Coffee Cast. My name's Dalton, and with me, as always, is my beautifully bearded friend, William. William, how are we doing today? What's up, Dalton? Uh, I'm doing pretty good, man. Uh, how are you doing? I'm great. I mean, it's, it's a typical, like, fall Canadian day. It's cold. It's rainy, so I don't think I'd rather be anywhere else, but, you know, talking a little <laughs> bit of physical therapy and sipping some coffee. You're right, man, and you know what? I've avoided the outside world today. I, I took it easy just kind of hanging out. Uh, so I don't even know what it's like outside. Well, you're not missing anything. <laughs> so uh, we're back at it again, guys, with another interview. Um, this week, we're interviewing uh, Dr. Jared Hall. He's a physical therapist, uh, a sports specialist, uh, a learner, an educator, um, and a pain science geek. So Jared, welcome to the podcast. Uh, thanks for having me on here, guys. I appreciate it. I'm, a, I'm down here in Texas enjoying the 80 degree sunny weather where you, while y'all are having the rainy Canadian fall. Oh, man. man. That must be nice. But I guess the trade off there is probably so much hotter in the middle of the winter, uh, summer, eh? Oh, it was, it was brutal this summer. This was like one of the hottest summers we've had in a while. Probably like 20 days consecutively over 100 Fahrenheit. Cool. Oh, man. I remember because uh, I used to play baseball and we used to travel down uh, down south and we, you would get off the bus, you know, and we had these like thick black jerseys because we're from Canada. You hop out, it's like you're literally in a stove. <laughs> it's bad. Yeah, I, mean, it's, I guess it's our advantage, home field advantage. We're used to uh, playing in the, the swamp and the sauna. <laughs> it's true. It's um, a definite advantage. So Jared, why don't you kind of just start off and give our followers a little bit of introduction to who you are, what's going on, uh, where you're currently practicing right now? Well, I'm a physical therapist or a physio down in um, Fort Worth, Texas. I run an outpatient orthopedic clinic, kind of very general clinic that, uh, you know, sees anybody from the age of 10 to 90, but has a pretty heavy focus on, on those people with persistently painful conditions. Um, I'm kind of an adjunct lab faculty member for the local DPT university, the University of North Texas Health and Science Center. So I teach there doing some guest lectures on um, exercise and pain science and as well as in the orthopedic curriculum. Uh, also, I um, teach a course with uh, my co-instructor, Marcos Lopez, uh, through Modern Pain Care, and that's called Applying the Science of Pain to Improve Patient Outcomes. And also with Mark Cargilla, uh, with Modern Pain Care as well, I'm a, one of the co-instructors for the uh, virtual mentorship that we run that has a focus on kind of implementing the, the modern understanding of pain into patient care, as well as uh, really developing clinical reasoning and critical thinking skills and that sort of stuff. So you don't sleep much? Uh, not, not a lot, not a lot. Oh, and <laughs> I, I, told, I told my my buddy and co-author Jim Hefner, who is a physical therapist in, in uh, Boulder, Colorado, that I would give a, a little shout out to the fact that him and I recently wrote a book, an ebook that was published called Sticks and Stones. Um, it's a compilation of stories and analogies to, to help people better understand pain. So I usually try to mention that. Yeah, I, um, I haven't had a chance to read it yet. I'm, I'm looking forward to doing that. Um, I guess we can kind of jump into that question going off that. Why, why do you think like, one, why did you guys go about writing that book? Um, and why do you think pain analogies and stories are so critical to educating um, people on pain? I mean, that's a, that's a really good question. I mean, I guess, why do I think it's so important? Uh, I, I don't know if you guys have interacted with or know much about who um, Dr. John Quintner is, but he's a, a pain specialist physician out in Australia. He kind of likes to refer to pain as what's what's called an aporia or something that we really don't, we can only describe through means of using something else. So the only way we know how to describe pain is by using other explanations. So it feels like a knife stabbing. 
it feels like fire is burning me. It feels like a million ants are biting me. It feels like ice. It feels like this. It feels like I've been hit with a baseball bat. Whatever it is, we can't really describe pain in and of itself. So right from the get-go, we're using analogies and metaphors, you know, just the general society to try to explain what pain is. And then what, what led us to write this book was the fact that when I was in school, I was kind of the biomedical, biomechanical guru and, and completely got my world exploded by uh, taking some courses with Adrian Lowe and getting into a lot of deep discussions with guys like Greg Lehman and Jason Silvernail and John Quinter, Quintner and um, Sandy Hilton and, and uh, Bronnie Lennox Thompson, people like this that are just extremely smart and pretty active on the social media side of things. And it made me really quickly come to the realization that I, have, I had no idea what I was doing. Everything that I felt like I knew, they were able to just completely poke holes in it. And uh, it brought me to a fork in the road, whether I was going to just ignore everything that they were saying and continue on about my merry way doing everything that I had learned in school or what that I thought, what I thought that I knew, or was I going to dig my heels in, you know, bite the leather and put my head down and start reading and learning as much as I possibly could. When I did that, I started learning a lot more about this whole pain thing. And immediately I started trying to explain pain to patients, you know, using neurobiology, talking about ion channels, talking about the ALS transmitting nociception to the brain, talking about rostroventral medial meduli and periaqueductal gray matters. And, and, and really I, just, I got a bunch of people that were looking at me with totally blank faces. They're just glazed over. They have no idea what I'm talking about. I didn't do anything but make them, you know, more confused. Well, then fast forward a couple of years of, you know, hundreds or thousands of failed attempts at, at educating patients. And what I started to see working repeatedly, and of course, learned through guys like Lorimer Mosley and David Butler and Adrian Lowe and all of those guys is that stories seem to connect uh, to people. People understand stories. They're like, hey, you know, I, I've been in that position before, or I've seen that before. I've learned that. That anecdotal type story evidence actually resonates a little bit more closely with people if they can put them, themselves in that position. So when I was in clinic, every time I would be trying to educate a patient about something and maybe I knew a little bit more about them and, and I had a feeling that I could, I could come up with something that would resonate with them, I started jotting down those stories. And, you know, the list just grew longer and longer and longer. And then through a crazy series of events, I, I partnered up with my co-author, Jim Hefner, who, just for the record, him and I did not like each other. <laughs> 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 early, early on there's a funny story about how I was a jackass to him online um, and he was a jackass back to me and we decided we didn't like each other at all and then we got forced to stay in the same room at a conference that we went to <laughs> uh, like literally a couple of months after we had decided that we hated each other and uh, you know we actually got to have some good face-to-face -face communication and conversations and got to hear where each other were coming from and and that's an exact example of how miscommunication and, and poor language led to a bad outcome when if we would have been a little bit more um, thoughtful with our language, we probably could have had a good outcome. But anyway, you know, I partnered up with Jim and he, he started spearheading some of the, the stories that he used with patients that he had seen resonate really well. And once we got to about 50, we said, damn, this is probably enough. We don't want to go information overload and just, you know, like have the book with 900 stories in it. So we decided to, to call it quits at a nice, nice even 50 and, and put that out as a resource that clinicians could use with um, their patients or even use themselves to have a little bit more ammo or, or to help them understand pain a little bit better as well, as if any of us really understand pain. Yeah, <laughs> yeah as if, eh? Yeah. Oh, man, that I really appreciate you uh, kind of taking us through that. Um, I think... Uh, what one question I want to ask is like, do you find yourself using specific analogies or stories like more often than others? Like, are there a few that you kind of like find really resonate with people? I mean, I probably have my top five or 10 favorite ones. Um, 
it, every single one that is in the book I, I have used before with somebody, but the, the things that I really, really like are um, explaining graded exposure through exposure to the sun and sunburns. If you, if you go a little bit too far and I love the idea of building up calluses and saying, Hey, you know, right now, maybe you, you're kind of like your hands that haven't worked for a while. And they're, they're a little bit uh, less resilient or less tolerant to stress or load as they, they possibly could be. So let's build a callus up on that. I, I do like talking about um, the, the nervous system kind of being like an alarm. But what I like more than that is how if you've had repeated um, alarms or, you know, you've, you've experienced pain for a long time, you, you might go out and buy a more expensive and more hyper protective alarm system that has more bells and whistles. Mm -hmm. so, uh, I like the, you know, really talking to people that have had sensitization over time, whether that's peripheral or central or, you know, who knows, but they just seem to have hyperalgesia and allodynia and that sort of thing about how they, they went out and bought themselves like a super high dollar, awesome alarm system. And maybe it's going off when the wind blows in the front yard when it shouldn't. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I think one of the questions you kind of mentioned it too, Jared, is like, I mean, pain is difficult. We, no one really truly understands it. And I think as new grads and students specifically, um, especially for myself, like trying to learn all this information, take it all in, and then trying to figure out how to put it into my own practice, like when I'm working with people. Um, what are some like tangible pieces of advice you could give to maybe like a newer new grad or a student that's trying to implement these things into their practice and not necessarily like over educating at times or going too far down the rabbit hole. I feel like it's a, it's a difficult balance sometimes. Uh, I mean, the biggest piece of advice that I could give because I failed at this so much myself is don't try to educate somebody all in one visit. You know, they don't have to know this stuff inside and outside the first time that they walk in Maybe they don't have a good relationship with you. Maybe you haven't gotten to know them quite enough to know what they think. Maybe they just don't feel comfortable opening up to you yet. Maybe, maybe if you're telling them something that, that um, goes against what they already believe, they're going to close you off and not be as willing to, to, to join in the plan of care that you're working with them through. So, you know, feel them out over a little bit of time, over maybe a visit or two or three or four or, you know, I have some patients that I haven't really broken through to them or, or got them to come to that aha moment until 10 or 12 or 15 visits down the road. You know, it might take 10 months or whatever it may be. And then finally, they get to that readiness to, you know, their, their stage of readiness to change gets to the point where, you know, things start to click and they're a little bit more open. So just don't think that you have to hit somebody right off the bat with all sorts of stories and analogies and neurobiology about pain, you know, maybe get them moving and build a good relationship with them. And, and, and a lot of the times the value can come in what you don't say. Maybe, maybe don't talk about structural faults. Maybe don't talk about rips and tears and arthritis. And maybe don't talk about how they're weak and immobile. Maybe just get them moving and be positive and avoid those, those words that could you know, maybe feel them a little, make, make them feel a little bit more negatively about themselves and, and try to focus on things that maybe increase their, their self-efficacy or, or help them switch to where they feel like they have the ability to make some positive change in their life. So, I mean, that would be, the, I think, the most important advice that I could give somebody. And then over time, you're just going to refine that. And I think that, you know, there's a lot of people that talk about the art and the science and the skill of what we do. And I think that, you know, we're constantly improving the science, but the art comes from knowing how much and how fast and when and where to dose the science and how to, how to connect with humans and, and how to have good solid interaction where, where you can build relationships with people and make them a little bit more willing to change their narratives or, or willing to try some new things. Nice. Do you, do you actually, uh, do you ever ask permission to educate? All the time. Yeah. Yeah. That's actually something that probably over the last year I have challenged myself to do a ton is to, to ask permission to, to go down a specific treatment route, to ask permission or ask a patient's interest in learning more about X, Y, and Z. I think that if you, if you ask permission and, and people say yes, or, you know, 
the floor is open for more of a interactive discussion rather than the old mentality of I'm the patriarchal medical provider and you're going to listen to what I say and let me lecture you and so on and so forth. I mean, we've got to, we've got to get out of that mindset and start and start joining in care with people rather than, you know, treating down at people. Right. Like more of like a relationship based uh, environment rather than like uh, I've even seen people challenging the whole like patient centered you know, and, and making it more like relationship centered. Yeah. You know, and I, I don't know if it's right or wrong, but I've been really trying to limit my usage of the word patient lately. I'm just, mm. we're just people. We're, we're just humans, you know, and I, I say the people that I work with and not necessarily putting that, that stigma of being a, a patient on them. A lot of people view themselves that way, but I wonder if they would view themselves that way if they hadn't already been, you know, kind of made to view themselves that way. Yeah. That kind of brings up a point. Cause uh, like Dalton and I were talking about it a bit before, like uh, obviously like social media is a good tool to, um, to put out information for people to learn from and stuff. Uh, something that we've kind of noticed is some people will put out things that are maybe, uh, you know, could help people, maybe understand it a bit more simply, like something like calling something a pain uh, receptor, you know, with the idea that that's easier than going about it a different way. What do you think about that? Like, do you think we really need to uh, uh, put a lot of effort in trying to make sure our posts are like as accurate as possible with that kind of thing? Uh, you know, this is, of course, this is just my opinion, but I think that we really do need to try to, to go the extra mile to not oversimplify in a way that completely misconstrues, you know, what the base message of, of the post is. If we're talking about pain receptors, if we're talking about pain pathways, if we're talking about things like that, that automatically, um, you know, puts pain in a place where it's a thing and a sensation and it's traveling up to the brain or it's being evaluated by the brain rather than, you know, the emergent experience that pain actually is. Uh, so I don't remember whose quote it is. I wish that I could remember off the top of my head, but it's, um, you know, to, to speak in wrong terms is to think in wrong terms. Right. Um, so I think that if you are really being cognizant of the language that you use and, and try and, you know, everything that you can to do no harm, we should, you know, work step by step towards maybe using less of that language. And, you know, nobody's ever going to be perfect. And if I look back at stuff that I said when I was trying to be helpful three or four years ago, I'm sure it was terrible. And probably in three or four years from, from now, when I look back at to what I'm saying right now, I'm going to say, man, that was really unhelpful. That was, that was stupid of me to say, but you know, we should continually be trying to get less wrong. Uh, so I think that we know that that stuff is wrong now. So we should try to try to minimally use it. Yeah. Cool. No. Yeah. That's awesome. Um, I kind of, I have a question for you. It's a little bit, it, it might be a little bit different than what we've been talking about, but I remember you posted something a little while ago um, about how we need to stop like blaming ourselves for a client that doesn't get better or not really putting the blame on like, solely on us or solely on the patient. Um, I just want, maybe you can touch on that a little bit. Cause that's something I feel like I've struggled with sometimes when I'm working with someone and I don't start to see outcomes getting better or they don't get better. I put a lot of pressure on myself and I'm sure this is something that other people experience, um, throughout their practice. Yeah. So I'm, I'm just going to start with saying, I, I still feel that way sometimes, or even a lot of the time. And, uh, you know, we have this mindset that we, we come into school because, and we go into this profession because we want to help people. And it feels really good to be, you know, the quote unquote, the healer. It feels really good to be the hero. It feels really good to, to fly in and swoop somebody off of their feet and save the day. Um, but at the end of the day, if you're, if you're trying really hard and you're learning as much as you can and you're taking your time with your patients and you're, or you're the people that you treat to the people that you work with. If you're listening to them, if you're trying to build a relationship with them and you're, you're providing care to them that is at the best of the ability that you know how you can't beat yourself up if they don't get better because maybe they weren't ready to get better. 
maybe what you could provide them just wasn't what they needed at the time. Maybe there's confounding factors going on, like things that are going on at home or things that are going on at work that are outside of both of your control. Maybe there's, um, you know, other factors going on that we have no idea about uh, that are limiting their ability to, to get better at this particular point in time. But if you're, if you try your best and if you give somebody everything that you have, you can't go home and, and beat yourself up because you can't measure um, your own self-worth based on people's outcomes. You can only measure it on the things that you can control and you can only control um, how good of a job you try to do providing the best care that you know how to provide. Yeah. Is that, um, is that a conversation you have sometimes with, with a client? Like if you get to that point where, you know, things aren't starting to improve, um, do you bring up the things like there's, there may be many other factors that, that are playing into it that can be in, inhibiting you that may, might be out of like their control and your control? Yeah, that's definitely a conversation that, that I will try to have with people if, if we get to that stage. And, uh, you know, sometimes, you know, after, after seven or eight or nine or 10 visits, people still are not willing to entertain the idea that pain is not purely biomedical. Um, and in that case, we have to hope for what's called the boomerang effect. And I think, I think Greg Lehman came up with this idea, another, another Canadian, eh? Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> he, um, he talks about the boomerang effect of how if you give patients all this information and you, you know, you point out that maybe there's other factors going on in your life that could be influencing your pain. And uh, this whole pain thing, it's complicated and it's not necessarily directly tied to tissue damage. Well, maybe, maybe they're not ready to hear it right now, but maybe they go out and cycle back around six months or six years down the road and they come back in and they're hearing the same thing from you or from the next guy down the road and they're ready to hear it that time and they're ready to take that step of change. So you might feel like you quote unquote failed somebody, but you might've just really laid the groundwork for somebody else to hit a home run down the road. Yeah, that's a great point. That's a good thing to keep in mind. I think I was, uh, I was actually listening to your guys's clinical thinker podcast and uh, you guys complete waste of time, dude. Don't <laughs> <laughs> shut it off. Delete it. <laughs> yeah. Forget everything you heard. No, but I was actually, uh, I was, it resonated with me because you guys were talking about the idea of like describing um, pain as like coming from the brain. And then you guys were talking about how, uh, you know, we've, we've already kind of made this mistake with, how we've interpreted like imaging findings in the past. So I was, I was wanting to hear what your thoughts are as far as like, how can we make sure we don't fall into the trap of having our patients like walking away thinking that we just told them that their pain is in their head. Well, I mean, specifically to the point that you're bringing up from that aspect of the podcast, you know, we were, we were talking about making sure that we don't, um, put the cart before the horse of ascribing too much value to like functional MRI findings and that sort of thing with brain activity in regards to pain yet. Well, I mean, we're seeing some interesting and cool stuff and there seems to be some correlations between um, pain experience and changes in sensory perception and, and what happens uh, in the brain on a functional MRI. But right now it's, it's just correlational. You know, we can't show direct causation. So we, we need to just simply be aware that correlation is not causation. And, and we've, we've gone down that road of putting the car before the horse before, uh, you know, a million times in, in the rehab in the medical world. So just simply being aware is the first step to not making that mistake and kind of reserving understanding that we just don't know yet and, and kind of being comfortable with that gray area of we don't know what we don't know yet and hopefully we'll, we'll figure out a little bit more of that stuff as, as science evolves but to circle back around to uh, trying to make sure patients don't leave or people don't leave um, thinking that pain is all in their head uh, I think that we have to talk about pain as an experience and that all pain is real and you have to validate somebody's experience of pain. And 
hopefully you can talk about how, oh, absolutely, I think that maybe some of that, that old injury that you have is definitely playing a role, but we know that the body is really good at healing, but your nervous system or your memories um, can also influence that. So let's talk about how this, that, and the other could play a role. Let's, let's validate what they believe and let's use the yes and approach where yes, that's, you know, that's totally right. And I totally understand that. And I don't understand your pain, but I understand that you are in pain and you're experiencing pain. Let's talk about some of the factors that could affect that. And hopefully they start to see that it's not just a brain thing. It's an immune system thing and it's an endocrine thing and it's a tissue sensitivity thing. and It's a nervous system thing and it's a beliefs thing and it's a sociological thing. And maybe, maybe they can start to see that, that really big, uh, pie chart of all the infinite things that could go into that experience rather than, Oh, well, it's just in your head. Yeah. And then it, it kind of gives them things that they can look at, like what they can control or what you can actually try to, to impact to help them get better or, or lessen that, that pain experience for them. Oh yeah. And you know, that's, that's one of the reasons I like the cup analogy as well. Everybody's really familiar with the cup analogy of, you know, you put things into the cup and the cup overflows and the, it's kind of, you know, reminiscent of the um, allostatic loading model where, you know, everything that happens to you pulls you out of homeostasis and becomes some form of allostatic load. And I think that the allostatic load model is really good, but it, it it's not complete. And, you know, that's something that will we can, we can talk about later, but that might be an entire podcast on its own. <laughs> but but that's, I, I like to tell people, you know, you, th- there's, there's two main ways that we can go about this. We can put less stuff into your cup or we can work on getting you a bigger cup. And um, that gives them a little bit of control to say, well, here's some things that I can't take out of my cup, but here's some things that I can take out of my cup. Or, man, I've taken everything out of my cup that I possibly can, and it's still running over how can we go through steps to make my cup a little bit bigger so it doesn't run over so fast? So it puts the power in in their hands to say, you know, yeah, this is, we can totally change this and no, we can't change that. And that that's okay. We have to let them know that that's okay because what we don't want is people to start stressing about not being able to modify stressors in their life. (laughs) Stressing about stressing. (laughs) It's like a dream within a dream. (laughs) <laughs> um, before we, uh, before we transition into talking a little bit about critical thinking, um, this is the PT coffee cast. So we got to ask, we got to ask you how you brew your coffee. Oh man, this is, I'm a failure here. Uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm one of those people that doesn't drink coffee. I know. Go ahead. Roast me right now. Uh, no, no, no. It's okay. <laughs> no, no, co- no coffee pun intended. Um, I'm I'm lame and I'm drinking a berry flavored <laughs> Croy. Nice, a little sparkling water. It's you know it's effervescent. Every time I take a sip, it's almost like somebody yelled berries in the next room. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we we don't judge. We don't judge. Do you drink those, Dalton? I do. So I can't even I can't even say anything. <laughs> What's your favorite kind? Ooh, me or Dalton? Ah, uh, both of you guys. <laughs> I'm I'm more of a fan of the lemon. The lemonade one. So I, I, there's uh, probably one of my favorites is key lime. It's 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 good. It's it's limey, but it's a completely different flavor than the regular lime. So I I enjoy that on my hot Texas days. You know? <laughs> yeah. Hey, maybe maybe next episode will be the PT Lacroix uh, cast. <laughs> it has a nice ring to it. It does. You know what's funny though? I, I'm starting to catch like a bit of a trend because you're not the first person that's come on and said like they're not really a coffee person. And I feel like it usually tends to be people with like tons of energy. Does that fit your like, am I on the point on the ball with that? Oh man, I don't, I don't know if I have tons of energy or not. Um, 
maybe maybe that's what it is. Now, I'm not saying that I don't. <laughs> drink, I'm not saying that I don't have my caffeine fix because I, I definitely ingest caffeine, but it's just not coffee. And my, my wife, she is like the ultimate coffee drinker. Every time we travel somewhere, she's got to get like a locally, you know, roasted coffee and something that we can't get back home. And there's like six different bags of coffee in my pantry right now. Nice. We should have had her come on and tell, tell her favorite cup. I know. <laughs> um, okay. So we know we're part of the level up initiative. So we had the opportunity to um, see your critical thinking episode that you did um, on there. So um, just maybe what you could do is just define what critical thinking um, means. Uh, I feel like it's a term that's been highly talked about a lot as of late, especially throughout social media. So I think maybe just putting a definition to what critical thinking actually is before we get started. Well, I mean, we can give the textbook definition of critical thinking or I can give kind of like my spark notes, personalized view of, of what critical thinking is. And I think that, if I were to do that, it would be the ability to, critical thinking would be the ability to uh, remain skeptical and reserve judgment on a topic until you've made sure to gain all the information that you possibly can about that topic and reflected on it and uh, learned as much as you can about it um, before you decide where you stand on that topic. So really it's, it's thinking about, and as well as recognizing your own biases when you're trying to come to a conclusion on what you think about a specific topic or, or piece of information. So recognizing that, you know, my biases are X, Y, and Z. My biases are that I don't think X, Y, and Z treatments were based on all this research that I've read. And my biases are this, that, and the other. Um, so going into trying to make a rational decision um, while remaining skeptical, recognizing your own biases, um, and recognizing the different common ways in which humans um, fail to think through things, you know, different logical fallacies that make us jump to conclusions before we actually come to a good, uh, you know, cr critically thought out rational decision. And I know that's like super long way of saying it, but I, I, I don't think that you can, you can boil critical thinking down to a, a one or two word definition. And in my opinion. Right. Is part of that, like when you're listening to somebody, like, I think we're all probably guilty of it, but I feel like we'll listen, but we've already got our mind made up as far as what our opinion is. And I feel like practicing for me, a lot of it has been like, I'm trying to actually take in the information that people are telling me and then actually reflect on like what they just said. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, that's, that's called, you know, listening to uh, hear rather than listening to respond. So, you know, that's probably one of the biggest issues that, that most of us fall into is that we're already thinking about our response when the person that we're listening to isn't even halfway through whatever they're saying. And if you guys remember from the little uh, lecture that I did on critical thinking, we talked about steel manning an argument. Mm -hmm. So when, when somebody is, is discussing something with you, making sure to reflect back to them what it is that you heard so they can either agree or disagree that you received what they were trying to say. So this is something that literally it goes back. I didn't know that it was called steel manning at the time, but this goes back to like my premarital counseling that I went through with my wife, just about good communication and good usage of language. When somebody says something to you, it's like, Hey, this is what I heard you say. You did did you say X, Y, and Z? Am I am I hearing you correctly? Did I understand that? And they have the opportunity to say, Yeah, that's exactly right. Or no, that's not that's not what I meant. And maybe I didn't verbalize what I was trying to say well enough. Let me give you some more detail or some new some more nuance so we can move forward in good faith with this discussion. Yeah. That's a that's a good point. I think, I think that's a good thing to keep in mind too, when you're even just listening to uh, like a, a patient or client telling you their story um, and kind of just summarizing and putting it back on them and making sure that you heard everything that they said as well to make sure that you're both on the same page. 
Yeah, I think it's huge. I think it's huge. And for the same thing, when you give your little summary of findings to somebody at the end of your evaluation and say, hey, you know, this is what I found and this is what I think is going to be good. Now, um, what questions do you have about that? And can you give me a little bit of summary of what we just talked about to make sure that, you know, I know that you feel confident and comfortable with what we're doing moving forward. So that, that's something that I like to do with a lot of, uh, a lot of people that I work with is um, have them, you know, verbalize back to me the things that I've told them just to make sure. And I, and I say to them, um, you know, I'm, sometimes I'm not good at explaining things. So I just want to make sure that you understood the things that I was saying to you. Uh, so you put it back on yourself and, you know, you, you don't make it a problem with their listening or a problem with their ability to understand. You, you know, go ahead and say, you know, I'm not, I'm not always the best at communicating this stuff. Can we make sure that you've got a really good understanding of what I was trying to say? Uh, I think that's actually pretty important because I, I almost feel like sometimes if I'm, uh, asking them to like repeat it, it almost could, it could come across like you're doing that because maybe you don't think they're intelligent enough, you know, to, to give you like uh, the information that you just shared. So I really like that tip actually, like letting them know like, Oh, maybe, you know, sometimes I don't explain this very well. So I just want to make sure kind of thing. Yeah. And I think is something as simple as saying, what questions do you have versus do you have any questions? I mean, there's so many little nuances in the way that we, we engage in communication that can change the way that it goes. So if I say, do you have any questions? They can simply say yes or no. If I say, what questions do you have? I'm acknowledging that I understand and know that they have questions and I want to know what those questions are. And it's not really a yes or no question. They have to go the extra effort to actually decline um, asking any questions. And I, if you if you start doing that, I can guarantee you, you'll notice a difference in the amount of questions that you get at the end of you know your sessions with people. Yeah, that comes back to that art that you're talking about before, I feel like just having that those little things. And I think I feel like I mean, you could probably comment it, but I feel like that probably takes some time to develop the the confidence and the ability to to start implementing those things uh, into your practice. Did it take you a bit of time to get to get better at those things? It's it's still taking me time because yeah. you know I'm not I'm not going to sit here and claim to be some master at all this. And there's so right. many people there's so many people that are better than me by by miles. But you know I've been doing this for I guess five years now, and probably for the first three years I was a complete idiot and. <laughs> Maybe, maybe that year three to four, I felt like I wasn't quite as much of an idiot. And right now I just feel like I'm starting to get a handle on things. So, uh, you know, hopefully I can catch up to some of those, uh, some of those guys that are a lot more skilled at this stuff than I am in the, in the coming years. <laughs> I think though, like, uh, like you've kind of talked about it before, like it's at least starting the process of like reflecting on some of the maybe verbalizations you had with with clients and then and then trying to then actually implement it in a more effective way the next time so like actually committing to uh you've continuously evolving kind of thing oh 100 percent. and you know if you're lucky enough to to work in clinic with another another physio another clinician uh you should make an agreement with them to say hey when you hear me say something stupid or when you hear me say something that's you know nocebo like or threatening call me out you know pull me aside after that and say hey man i noticed that you said x y and z and you know most of the time you would say yeah i noticed that i said it afterwards and i was kicking myself but i you know i had to continue on with what i was saying and 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 you know not lose the patient's confidence or the person's confidence but having that accountability with somebody else in clinic and then having that ability to reflect on it and then maybe talk about different ways to go about it and, and practicing it, you know, thousands of times with thousands of, of people really helps you to, to refine those skills. And one of the things that I would say is slow down, man, slow, slow down how fast you talk to people and, you know, think about your words as an intervention. If you were gonna, if you're gonna have them do a really nice, um, you know, exercise like a squat, you wouldn't just say, "Okay, you've never squatted before. Let me come over here and throw 300 pounds on your back and go ahead and start squatting as fast as you can." 
because uh, that wouldn't be that wouldn't be a well dosed intervention. Think about the words that you use and the conversations that you have and the education that you do as um, as powerfully as you would think about how to dose out exercise or manual therapy or whatever it is, because it's it's super important and there's no doubt from a ton of data that that our language and the interactions that we have with people dramatically affect their outcomes. Right. Like you're almost using expectations in a, in a good way there where you're like setting the expectation that like the exercise is going to go well and like that you're going to be able to tolerate that. And like, you're using your words to actually like set up that like uh, exercise to, to hopefully uh, go as well as possible and stuff. Absolutely. Absolutely. Cool. So uh, to kind of just wrap things up, there's one, one more major question we had for you. And so we know that there's a lot of gray area in physiotherapy and there's so much, you know, to know and learn and continuing to educate yourself. Um, one of the things is like, how do we continue to improve our, our ability to like exert confidence in the uncertainty? Oh man, that's a, that's a deep question. <laughs> <laughs> We like to get deep um, from time to time. <laughs> well, I think that no matter what, it's, I mean, it's important that you're confident in, in what you're doing right now because you are a highly trained medical provider. You know, you can be confident in that. And for, for you guys especially, it, you're putting yourself out there to learn as much as you can. You're interviewing lots of, you know, interesting and smart people you're consuming a lot of literature you're in the you're in the level up initiative you're taking steps to self improve so if you're taking steps to self improve and you have that on top of this already super great education basis that that physio school gives you to build upon you need to be confident in that but understand at the same time that that science is a process of you know proving or making yourself less wrong through essentially proving things wrong, accepting or rejecting the null hypothesis over time. So understand that we don't know everything and that's okay. We can still help a hell of a lot of people, even not knowing everything. So just trying to not do any harm in the, in the process. And you can be super confident if you're doing that, if you're trying to do no harm, trying as hard as you can to do no harm and trying your best to, to work on self-improvement over time, you know, continually reading and, and self-reflecting and metacognition where you're thinking about the way that you think, then you have no reason to not be confident, um, even though there is so much gray and we're just waiting around in this big sea of gray. Uh, there are definite trends that say what is better and what is maybe not as good. So just follow those really strong positive trends that are in the gray. Yeah, I think, I think obviously, yeah, that's awesome. And I think, I think another thing too um, that I've started to try to do is just kind of stay within, like be self-aware enough to know, um, like to not go outside of like what you know. Like if I, there's, there's so much information out there and there's so many things that you can take in through social media, through podcasts, through research, but being, being confident in the basis that, you know, like developing a therapeutic alliance, treating, treating the person, like considering all factors of like the biopsychosocial model, like those things that we can take a stronghold on and not trying to, to reach too far out of the, the things that we might not be as confident in. And then you come across as not really knowing what you're trying to, to implement. Oh, I mean, absolutely. It's, it's powerful when you look at a, at a person that you're working with and say, you know, I'm really, really good right here, but I, I don't know as much about this. Can I refer you to this, this person that does? Yeah. Can I get you in the hands of this other expert? Because I'm recognizing that, hey, I'm an expert here and they're an expert there and not having to, you know, go into that zone that you're not confident or proficient in is is empowering for you and patients recognize that people recognize that okay this guy he's in it to help me and he recognizes that there this is a team effort and there's other people that are you know more proficient than him and at certain things and i think the times that i've had that happen when i was worried especially early on in my career i was worried that that the person was going to look at me and think that I didn't know what was going on or I just, I wasn't smart because I didn't have the answer right there. Um, that's not what happened at all. And they were actually really receptive and, and happy to, you know, have another expert on board that 
you know, I was referring them to with really good confidence. Awesome. Yeah. I think we'll, uh, we'll wrap it up there. So Jared, thanks for coming on. If you want to leave like where people can find you, where they can find your, your book, uh, where they can connect with you, let them, let them know. Oh yeah. So I'm, I'm pretty loud on social media, but <laughs> on Facebook, I'm, I'm Jared Hall. I have a professional page that's Dr. Jared Hall, PTDPT. And then um, on Instagram, I'm at Dr. Jared Hall, DPT. Uh, at, for, for the book that Jim and I wrote, Sticks and Stones, it, it is the ebook. It is on therapeuticalliance.com. And it, this was, in hindsight, it was a terrible idea, but we thought it was really clever. It's therapeuticalliance.com. <laughs> Tom, so we're, we're like trying to throw the PT in the middle of therapeutic. So it's not actually spelled therapeutic. It's therapeutic alliance. <laughs> yeah, we, we totally thought we were trying to be clever and that was just a bad idea. <laughs> oh man. Well, you didn't go to marketing school, I guess, right? <laughs> I did not. <laughs> Can't blame you. Awesome, Jared. Thanks, 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 thanks so much, much for coming on. Like we, we know you have a lot going on. You're a busy guy. So we appreciate you taking the time to come on and chat with us. No, man, I, I appreciate you guys. And I'm, I'm, I'm really happy to, to be able to get on here and, and share what little experience, you know, the few years of experience I do have with, with anybody who's willing to listen. So hopefully if there's any questions or if there's anything I can help you guys out with in the future, just let me know. Awesome. Thanks, Jared. Thanks so much. We'll talk to you soon, man. Later, guys. <laughs>